Good morning and good afternoon to you all. My name is Emily Huynh and I am with the I Am Not A Virus campaign and I will be your moderator in facilitating the conversation today. I do want to, you know, um, acknowledge, so right now I'll go through a little bit of an intro. Um, it'll take maybe five to six minutes of time after that. I am fully moderator, listener. Um, and then we'll move into introductions of all of our wonderful panelists um, and they'll give us uh, their name, their pronouns if you'd like to share, and why uh, your role and why advocating for equity in education is important to you. And don't worry, I'll also state that again when, I, when it's time to introduce you all so you don't have to remember all of that now. Um, and then we'll go into a dialogue um, for about 30 to 40 minutes uh, where I will ask some, some questions for our panelists. And then we will have a bit of time at the end to go through some Q&A uh, with our panelists. There is a Q&A at the bottom of your screen. So um, feel free to send in some questions um, and we'll try to answer them in chronological order. And our panelists today have gra graciously agreed to give us 15 extra minutes of their time. So feel free to stay on if you wanna you know, keep continuing the conversations um, and feel free to drop off, drop off if you have you know, um, a hard stop. So I wanna thank the panelists for taking the time to be here today and sharing your perspectives and experiences with us. And I also want to thank the Commission of Women, Children, Seniors, Equity and Opportunity and their Executive Director, Steven Hernandez, Co-Chair Alan Tan and Latino and Puerto Rican Policy Director, Werner Oyandel for providing the space to amplify these important conversations. So thank you. And thank you to the I Am Not A Virus team for supporting me and trusting me to facilitate this panel. And finally, thank you all for making the time to join this webinar for our conversations around equity and inclusion in education. I hope that today's conversation will benefit you in your journeys as a student, educator, policymaker, advocate, and individual. So before we start introducing our panelists, I'd like to take five or so minutes of your time to say a few words about the current state and current climate of living in the US, especially as it relates to systemic racism and institutional oppression. If you are not familiar with these terms, systemic racism refers to the systematic subjugation of racial groups through the wealth gap, employment, housing discrimination, health disparities, mass incarceration, immigration arrests, infant mortality, and so on. The list continues. Institutionalized oppression is the systematic mistreatment of people within a social identity group supported and enforced by the society and its institutions solely based on the person's membership or perceived membership in a social identity group. Now I realize there may be some global folks on the call, so I apologize in advance for the ethnocentric perspective, but I am I will say that I'm aware that my intro is focusing on Black and African American communities, but I am also here to raise the voices and perspectives around the heinous attacks on Asians and Asian Americans across the nation due to COVID-19. Asian voices have been erased and silenced for far too long in the conversations around race. And this is the very reason we have come together for I Am Not A Virus to advocate for the space and Asian American experiences and history to be a part of our education and part of the conversation. So we stand up for ourselves and other marginalized groups to advocate for inclusion of all underrepresented experiences and histories to be a part of our education. And it is especially important now as we see the heartbreak and plight of Black America come to surface on the media. The voices of Black Lives Matter have roared across the nation in protests and rallies condemning the unjust and heinous murders of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and many, many more. And this is just the very tip of the iceberg. These are the snowflakes on the tip of the iceberg of the thousands of lives taken by police violence. There's a common thread that I see in racism that breeds these heinous crimes, and that is indifference. If individuals are indifferent, if they're saying that they don't see color, they don't involve themselves in politics, they don't have an opinion, don't challenge racist jokes, and we see this, we may see this as harmless, but this is the very mindset that leads individuals to minimizing the experiences, pains, and traumas that our marginalized communities face, which gaslights and invalidates them to feel like they are fabricating their own experiences of pain and subjugation, when in reality, there is evidence. This breeds a mindset that tolerates prejudice, discrimination, sometimes even celebrate it. And this indifference is what leads to a population of people that dehumanize others based on the color of their skin, to a point where they can turn a blind eye when those groups are being wrongfully, wrongfully murdered on a large scale. And it draws eerie, eerie parallels to the phenomenon of people 
witnessing the genocide of a group of people. It is the indifference that leads people to dehumanizing groups to a point where they can stand idly by and just while they are being unjustly murdered at a large scale. All of this begins at an individual level. So when we're in classrooms with the youth, the individuals that will shape our future, what is it that we want them to learn? The current curriculum tells us to teach them the quadratic formula, but not necessarily mandating the teaching of how to empathize with and celebrate others that are different from them. We don't necessarily teach them to challenge the societal norms around gender, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, religion, ability, disability, and much more. We don't teach them to move away from prejudice and indifference and move to recognition, validation, empowerment of other people. It's about inclusion. Parents, educators, teachers, professionals, you're all individuals that students trust. And students, who are you looking to to shape your perspectives? Who do you trust? Challenge that. As adults, we may not have grown up in the same generation having immediate access to information, knowledge, and news stories, but our perspectives were shaped in a different decade. However, we have a responsibility to envision a much better future for the youth and their children to come after. We have a responsibility to take part in guiding them to this future. We have to dismantle the way that we've been conditioned to think about others that are different from us. Let's not turn a blind eye to what makes people unique and different, what individual obstacles that they have that bar them from being successful. So let's give them access, opportunities to enable them to climb over those obstacles. Let's celebrate them for their differences, give them tools to harness their unique experiences to prepare them for life's hardest challenges and let's show them that they belong and that they're loved. Most of all, let's embed this into our curriculum and pedagogy so we can ensure that it permeates our ed educational institutions. Focus on policy making so that we can ensure that these changes are sustainable and create a ripple effect. Education is going to be the most powerful tool in our toolbox in helping us in the long laborious work of unraveling the institutional mechanisms that hold up the systematic subjugation of marginalized communities. And I'm so disheartened that the black and African American communities have had to take the emotional and physical burden of being the group that sparked this conversation for individuals um, that have been privileged enough to be indifferent up until this point across the world. And so to the black community, stay strong, stay resilient. We will stand together and fight injustices together so that we ensure that black lives at the very minimum matter, but also that you're celebrated and credited for the achievements you've made to further innovation in arts, so that your struggles and triumphs are heard and empathized with, a and a representative history is taught in schools and to ensure that your futures matter. And with that, I, I want to um, introduce myself as a moderator, um, and then I will introduce our amazing panelists. I apologize that that was very long-winded, um, but I wanted to kind of draw the connection of what's been going on in this world to the power we have in education um, with all of these amazing individuals who are doing this work on a daily basis. Um, so uh, my name is Emily Huynh. I grew up in West Hartford, Connecticut. I am Asian American. Um, my ethnicity is Chinese. Uh, my parents are survivors of the Khmer Rouge genocide. Um, so, you know, growing up, I had a lot of, uh, a lot of challenges, um, but, you know, after kind of doing some soul searching, after going to any town, which is held by the National Conference for Community Justice, and met individuals like Gozer, who, you know, helped to guide me through that journey um, and learn about systematic, system, systemic racism, institutionalized oppression like this, and, and really empowered us to make the change uh, to go forward. Um, so thank you for that, Gozer. <laughs> um, and I feel like I wouldn't be here today and be able to speak on this uh, without the experiences that you and uh, the NCCJ have given me. So um, with that, I'm also an HR professional. So I'm trying to learn how to embed this work into the corporate world, which has a lot of parallels to educational institutions. So I'm really excited to sit here and learn from you all today um, and your expertise. Uh, so with that, I will introduce our wonderful panelists um, again. So I told, I promised I would tell you uh, your name, your pronouns, if you'd like to share. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. And um, why advocating for equity in education is important to you and what your role is. So if we want to start, uh, I'll just go in chronological order of where I see you on my screen. So Julia, do you want to start? Sure. Um, let me unmute. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Julia Wong, and my preferred pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I am one of the co-founders of the Immigrant History Initiative, um, where we work to bring um, ethnic studies and curricula that 
reflects and centers around the experiences and stories of immigrant communities, particularly communities of color. Um, and because of my and my co-founder's personal background, we began by producing a Chinese American history curriculum that um, works to sort of inject into um, the curriculum conversations about racial justice, as well as um, unpacking some stereotypes, um, such as a model minority myth. And um, so sort of advocating for equity in education is one of the central tenets of our work at the Immigration History Initiative. Um, for me personally, um, the reason I got into this work and the reason it's so important to me is, you know, education really provides the building blocks to our society. Um, education and your experience um, in your education um, growing up is kind of is very determinative, right, of the person that you'll become and the views that you'll have. And I think it's true for policymakers, it's true for future educators, for parents. And I think getting the getting an, ex, an equitable educational experience is really important. And I think how you see the world and what is particularly um, important to us is that we think it's very important to teach an education about racism and the history of racism and to center the experiences of black, indigenous, and other people of color um, within the education curricula and, and and I think it's really essential to understanding right the history of systemic racism like you've mentioned Emily um, and, and sort of begin um, I think addressing it um, at the very at the very beginning. Awesome. Thanks for being here Julia and thanks for your introduction. Kathy would you like to go next? Yes thank you. Um, my name is Kathy Liu. I am the other co-founder of the Immigrant History Initiative. Um, my pronouns are she her hers. Um, and I guess I'll just skip straight to why I am really passionate about working on equity in education. Um, and I think Julia has already talked a lot about this, but the real, like the reason that we created the Immigrant History Initiative is because I think we see education as such a key player in students' identity formation from such a young age. And it shapes not just how we see ourselves, right, in our position in society, but also how we interact with the communities around us, with the world around us. And so I really see education as a testing ground for where we decide what knowledge is important and the kinds of skills that we want to be passing on to the next generation. So it's really a mirror of what we as a society value at this moment. And up until now, the stories of immigrants and people of color have been systematically erased, they've been undervalued, they've been co-opted. And so by working to elevate these stories, it's not just about changing education, right? But it's about working to build a more just society, which in this moment, and I'm so grateful for your statement, Emily, um, like in this moment, this is particularly important to talk about. Thanks so much, Kathy. Um, Gozer, would you like to go next? Sure. Uh, so I'm Gozer Yang. I'm a middle school history teacher in Hartford. Um, I've been doing e equity in education for me stems from, like many of us, our own personal experiences. Um, and it's, I think what uh, Julia and Kathy shared in their intro is why equity is important for me. It's a sense, I think, um, embedding concepts in, in curriculum and content in school culture is what creates um, confidence and a sense of safety and security um, for individuals whatever age they are I think including parents in the community to feel safe and secure in a learning environment you know one of the things I always say is school is the safest place a student can make a mistake right so I want it to remain safe, and I think it's important that, for me, that equity has a component of safety as a goal. Um, and that is safety in, in who they are, in identity development, you know, like feeling good about it. I think that's part of uh, when we begin to talk about the ethnic studies bills. I think that's one of the things is, are our students, Asian and Asian American students, confident to stand up and say, hey, our history is not being shared. And I think that's a component that I'd like to see um, begin uh, hope, as soon as possible, because I think that's the piece that's, that's missing. Oh, and I'm sorry, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Awesome, thank you, Gozer. Steven, would you like to go next? Thank you so much. Thank you, Emily. Uh, my name is Steven Hernandez. I'm the executive director of the Legislature's Commission on Women, 
children, seniors, equity, and opportunity. And um, I, I get to go every day and say that equity is in the name of what I do every single day. That's, that's how I wake up and how I go to bed. And I'll tell you, why is education equity especially important to the work that we do? You know, what's interesting is that the, the, old, the old adage that knowledge is power uh, really is the beginning of a, of a much bigger understanding that knowledge is peace, knowledge is bonding, knowledge is a way of really <clears throat> of expanding our access to each other. And when I think about education, I think about so, an academic, social, and emotional skills building. And through that enrichment of each individual, we have the toolbox, we build the toolbox of being able to do work together and improve each other's lives together, and, and by extension, our own. So, so I think that why is that education, edu, uh, equitable access to educational opportunity important to me? It's because it is the only thing I believe that will ensure that we survive as a species, that we survive as a community, and that we survive as individuals. Awesome, thank you so much, Stephen. Rosina, would you like to go next? <laughs> Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rosina Haskins. I serve as the Director for Diversity Advancement for the West Harbor Public Schools. I identify as an African-American, Jamaican-American female, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And thank you, Emily, for your powerful opening statement, acknowledgement, and solidarity. I affirm Black Lives Matter. And I stand for universal humanity. And you know, over the past couple of weeks, I have redefined what commitment looks like to me and feels like to me. So it's been, it's been painful uh, because I hold myself accountable. And I will do everything that I can to make this moment a movement for universal humanity. Um, I do believe that we have reached a tipping point of racial justice pandemic, and, and it's emerged during the storm of a global health and safety crisis. But with crisis comes opportunity for change, right? So while I have this um, hollowness in my spirit right now, being here today gives me a lift. And um, I feel so honored to share this space with this panel of agents for social justice and change. So, so thank you for, um, for allowing me to be here. So advocating for equity um, in education, it's a loaded one for me. High quality education is our best shot for students, but equitable access opportunities, distribution of resources and supports are essential for any student to have the best chance to develop knowledge, skills, and dispositions that they need to fully engage in, in their own communities and in society. And I genuinely believe, genuinely believe that ed, equity in education improves the life chances for students um, when, in their school age years and as adults. And I feel that giving children an equitable launch at the starting line fosters better social and economic outcomes for them and for the communities that they call home and workplace communities that they serve. So I don't wanna repeat what others have said before me, but so I'll, I'll share a personal story that shaped my passion for equity. And I, I probably have never, share, have never shared it um, before eight years ago, but um, from my personal perspective, I feel that every child needs a, a champion. And I didn't find anyone in the nine different public schools and private schools that I had attended from pre-K to, to graduation. Um, I used to dodge this question about my schooling because I didn't want people to think that I came from a broken or unstable home. And in fact, I always felt loved and nurtured by my parents, grandparents, and extended family, uncle and aunts. But, um, and I still feel that way now. But as a young child, I witnessed things that robbed me of my childhood. And um, I witnessed horrible crime onto someone very close and dear to me at a young age. And the justice system was slow to respond. And and the, and the intimidation and the, the threat and power of um, the perpetrator just loomed over my family. So schools couldn't keep me safe, the legal system couldn't afford me protections, and my family was a village, and they positioned themselves to strategically ensure uh, that I was safe. And so I say all of that because, you know, Outside, of, I had to attend schools outside of my neighborhood where I, you know, knew my family, I knew my friends and outside of the district. And I share that story because I experienced trauma, not associated just with a single event, 
but it was compounded with enduring structural and systemic racism as a vulnerable black child. And it impacted my ability to develop, learn and grow so significantly. And so it's been my experience personally and professionally that schools, the healthcare system, court system, social services agency, they apply a different treatment and care and response to vulnerable and at risk students, um, and particularly those of color. And so, you know, I just feel that I found my champion and my family's not the nine schools that I attended. And so while I used to unintentionally look at the, the cracks in the foundations of schooling, now that I've come to have a personal growth and development, I've learned to apply like more of an equity lens to the treatment and, and attempt to understand the root causes. So I'll close with, I don't, I don't at all sit here today as the face of what's right with schools. And I suspect that I was invited to share this platform so that I can truly hear the voices of others. Um, I've been, you know, sharply criticized for not moving swift enough, deep enough, fast enough, or pushing hard enough or pulling strong enough. But I try to show up for kids every day and I have the privilege that allows me to do so and a permanent reminder of my why and why I showed up today with a full plate and a heavy heart. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Rosina. I mean, I, I can't even begin to express how thankful and grateful, you know, I, I think we all are for you sharing your story and seriously, how, how representative it is of the work that you do every day, you know, showing up for being that champion um, for children. And especially, you know, coming from me as a, as a student who, who came from the West Harper public system, I, I am so, so happy to see that you are in the position that you are. I'm just, so um, thank you for sharing, Rosina. And Yukio, would you like to introduce your, yourself? Sure, thank you. Um, thank you for I Am Not A Virus and for the commission um, for hosting this. It's really um, an amazing space for me to be in, to see all these Asian faces and change agents. Um, and thank you, Rosina, for opening up in such a way I know um, I have been so privileged to work with you for the last five years, I think, and you've let me cry in your office. Um, you've always listened, you know, for parents' perspective, and you've been such a great champion and partner. And um, and I, you know, and I hope that we can continue that partnership uh, to make sure that all our kids, you know, not just my kid, you know, um, but all our kids get access and um, to education. And I. I would love to be able to give you a hug. <laughs> so, hug. Um, and my pronouns, she, her, hers. Uh, and why, why, why is this important for me? Um, I think, you know, being an immigrant kid moving to the U.S. Um, and my, you know, immediate launch into, you know, this country was of hardship, of getting bullied, um, of being pointed out, you know, why I was not welcomed. Um, and I became an educator, you know, I also didn't see myself reflected as an educator in the system. Um, and now as a parent, you know, I reflect back to all my experiences as a student, but also as an educator. And then I'm trying to reflect on the education that my daughter, who is an American born child and, and her access to, to information or, you know, her story is very limited still and similar to what it was for me, however many decades ago, I don't want to say, but decades ago. Um, and so, you know, I'm constantly just trying to reflect, trying to see where we can make the small changes, um, but I'm hoping that we can take this moment to make a really big systemic change um, that is sustained um, and not just in the moment, but a sustained change. So thank you again for giving me this opportunity to be on the panel um, and I'm hoping that I can learn more from everyone else here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yukio. Um, you know, hearing all of you introduce yourselves, you know, this is an introduction and I, I already feel so moved by the work that you all are doing and also the personal, professional space that you have in this as well. And it just, you know, it, it, it moves me to be on this panel with you all. So thank you all for being here. And also, you all are so humble in your, in your presence on the panel as well. So I appreciate that. Um, I'm really excited to you know, get into these questions and hear from you all. Um, so let's start with um, our first question. Um, just wanted to 
you know, I think you all touched on this a little bit um, when answering the question of importance of equity in education, but when including perspectives that have been historically misrepresented or even missing from our curriculum, what impact does this have for our students when they see themselves represented in the curriculum? Or maybe what, what is the impact when they see that they are not represented? Um, so I'll open this up to you all. I know that um, I think Yukio, would you like to speak? I see you. Sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I think Rosina has start, um, heard this story before in a separate panel um, this past winter. Um, but, you know, as a kid growing up in the 80s, um, I just dated myself so you can do the calculation. Um, but um, we moved to ch the Chicago area. Um, in the 80s, we're not friendly to Japanese. That was the era of who killed Vincent Chin. Right. Um, and and I went to a predominantly um, white school and because my dad was like, we're going to America and we're going to we're going to pursue the American dream and we're not going to live, you know, where a lot of the Asian community members live. We're going to go at it, you know, and fully integrate and assimilate. Right. That was the that was the word back then to assimilate um, and not seeing anyone like me, not seeing educators, not seeing representation in the media, not seeing anything in the books that I was reading. Several years later, I, I wanted to be white, right? Um, and, you know, I was not going to Japanese school anymore on the weekends. I wanted to be white. I had my hair permed. I sprayed sun in to make it lighter. I, you know, there were all these damaging things, now that I think about it, that I was doing to myself and my identity and what it meant to be me. Um, and so I think, you know, when you don't see yourself reflected in the content, but also in the, the environment that you're in, it's pretty damaging to a kid um, growing up and trying to figure out who they are. Um, and then you end up with a lot of the generational conflict and the, you know, the, the cultural conflict that you have with your parents as well. Um, so it's, it's not an easy time. Um, so that's why for me, I think having representation, you know, in the educators, in the curriculum, in leadership, in media, like crazy rich Asians. Oh my gosh. <laughs> how beautiful was that like yeah. i cried because there were so many asians on that film like you know it, it was supposed to be a romantic comedy and i cried most of the way through um and so you know that's why for me it's important to have that representation <laughs> yeah um i, I want to ride that a little bit you know being an educator and when i decided to be an educator one of the scariest things was what is my role because being a, a social justice person and knowing that I want to combat race, racism and oppression and systemic um, oppression systems all over, I couldn't figure out, like, like there was, um, like, am I a role model? And if I'm a role model, who am I a role model for? And, you know, the, mess, the, the role model that I sought so much as a student was I asserting myself as that? And, and am I equipped to be that role model for Asian American students? You know, so I think that that's a piece um, that you, you, you're, you're talking about there. You know, as a young person, I always told my story as I was riding the line. You know, I was a totally different person at school than I was at home. Um, and that's not easy to translate into adulthood in a professional, in a profession that is, predominantly not Asian or Asian American. You know, and e even though I have my heart and I'm passionate about all of this, I don't know which role in education is most important for me to be in so that I can get uh, the most access to resources that students need to be become aware of it. And I think that that's, um, that, that's part of it. You know, not having the representation growing up for myself, I'm kind of having to create this this role for myself and how do I do that so that I can support not just Asian and Asian American students, but to bring awareness for other communities of different um, backgrounds and identities so that they understand that for Asian and Asian Americans, the adversity is diverse. 
And that's part of the reason why the modern minority myth is so prominent is because like, honestly, I don't, I don't have time to deal with the racism because I have to go home and like be this good little girl, or I have to be this really good role model that doesn't speak about injustices because that's not typical for an Asian or an Asian woman or an Asian woman who happens to be a leader in education where there isn't a voice for Asian to advocate for it. Um, like the, the bill, the ethnic studies bill or um, curriculum or anything, you know, policy programming. Um, I, I think one of the things that I'd like to see come out of this is commune, you know, we say a village, it takes a village to raise a child. Um, I love to see Asian and Asian American individuals and even not reach into the schools and the communities, kind of like what Julia and Kathy are doing, but as role models, um, we at my school is predominantly black and brown students. And we run very well with the community, with Catholic charities, we have big brothers um, and big sisters that come in. And there's a lot of support for our, my black and brown students. But, but where is that type of community support for our Asian, Asian American students? And it's not that it doesn't exist, you know, it's that it doesn't necessarily lend itself to it. And a lot of times, um, what I find for my Asian, Asian American students is really trying to educate them on their, the types of racism that they are experiencing because they minimize it, you know, um, because it's not comfortable to talk about racism for an Asian or Asian American student. I'm not black, so how do I say that that was racist towards me? Because usually their age group is not aware that racism happens to Asian or Asian American students also. It's not looked at as something that as, as egregious because it's not in the news as often. It's not well understood. Um, so I think that that's, it's dangerous to be misrepresented for a number of levels, a number of reasons. I think, you know, it's, it's also, it's, it's long-term damaging for children. Um, you know, the children of dominant, of the dominant narrative, it's damaging for them because, you know, they grow up in a world where they can't see themselves in the full context of the richness of the world that we live in. And that's dangerous. It's dangerous because it creates false narratives about expectations of other people. It creates dangerous moments of, uh, of, of the meeting of difference or perceived difference and how that is managed. Um, and it's certainly dangerous and long-term damaging to the children of the, of the, of the, that live in silence. And that silence is, is, so, is so damaging because not being able to see yourself in the dominant narrative or in the narrative of dominant culture, you, that invisibility uh, translates into pain. That invisibility translates into long-term feeling of otherness and a long-term feeling that your, your participation in the civic fabric is not welcome here. You know, it's interesting. Another shout out to Chicago. I, I was a kid, you know, age myself. I was a kid in the in the 70s and early 80s in Chicago. We eventually moved to Texas, God help us. But um, in Chicago was interesting because I grew up uh, in an incredibly segregated city, incredibly segregated. I mean, so segregated that it was almost, it was crass from one block to the next. You as a kid knew where not to go. And the real blessing for me was that I was actually able to go to a magnet school that was majority black, and my teachers were majority black. And what that did, when I tell you that as an eight-year-old, going from a totally, you know, a white-dominated culture, right, to going to a majority black led, a majority black taught, and, and kids that were, that were in my, my cohort, it was so powerful for me. It changed my life for the better. And it changed my life because I was able to see myself in a context that was much, much bigger than me. And that's what I wish for every single kid, whether you're in a majority uh, majority um, uh, narrative school or not. And that's why it's important that our curricula expand to include the global narrative. 
Yes, so much of what everyone else has said really, really resonates with me, especially the stories shared by Yukio and by Gozer. I think um, I actually, before this panel, I was really excited, so I compiled some statistics, and I think like hard numbers can also really help drive home the point that when you have ethnic studies, it actually results in really tangible material gains for students. Um, and so I'm just gonna rattle them off really quickly, please bear with me. But um, one study in San Francisco found that attendance at um, an ethnic studies course at the high school actually increased attendance of students broadly, just school attendance, by 21%. And it increased GPA by 1.4 grade points. So someone who was at 2.6 might go up to a 4.0. Um, and, and it also resulted in students participating in this class actually taking 23 more credits than before on average. And I think like all of these things really point to increased student engagement even outside of the ethnic studies class itself, even when you're just taking like a single ethnic studies class in a single program. And if you look at Tucson, Arizona, which had one of the pioneering uh, Mexican American studies programs at a high school, it's now been dismantled because of really targeted opposition. But before it was dismantled, their students were over 100% more likely to pass standardized tests, over 50% more likely to graduate. And I really like bringing these numbers in because they're so stark and I think it really shocks people when they hear about it. But if you really think about it, and I think like added together with like all these personal stories that have been shared that are so important, the reason that these ethnic studies classes are so powerful is because it's really all about identity formation. I think especially for students of color who are experiencing racial microaggressions and even outright instances of racial bullying in their everyday lives, these classes provide a starting point for them to be able to grapple with these experiences because oftentimes students growing up, they don't have the language right. or like the theoretical grounding to really be able to articulate and parse through what's happening. And so these ethnic studies classes, by giving students a space to actually talk about their identity, to talk about racism in a very deliberate and intentional way, it increases pride in self, it increases pride in racial identification, and that in turn increases student engagement because they they're more motivated they see a reason for it and it's all like the, the other things in their life outside of school the patterns that they're seeing in the neighborhoods around them it all starts to make a little bit more sense because you have the grounding of the ethnic studies class and i think also, I want to talk a little bit too about our white students, right? Because I think oftentimes the narrative around ethnic studies classes, it's all about the students of color. And I think some opponents frame this debate as, as not helping white students or even giving them an extra burden. They have to learn this too on top of all the other classes. And I think that narrative and that way of thinking is actually like fundamentally incorrect. Mm -hmm. Because studies have also shown that learning about racism actually oftentimes has a greater impact on white students than students of color. And it's because they oftentimes don't have the same opportunities to directly confront racism in their everyday lives. So these classes have a much bigger impact on them. And what's more than that, researchers also see significant gains in empathy for white students. And not just like cross-racial empathy, just empathy in general. And so these classes, I think, like I don't think it would be out of place to say that these classes are actually making students into better people, into more committed citizens for our democracy. Um, and by excluding these stories of historically marginalized communities from our classrooms, we're not just robbing students of color, but we're also robbing our white classmates of these really important opportunities for self-growth and reflection. Yeah, I think I, I agree with you 100%. And I think about um, my student population and I know that it, it would benefit. That, that, that's the main reason why I switched from a science engineer major to teach social studies in middle school. Um, there's no better position for me to be in than to teach social studies because I get to teach culture, uh, world geography. It lets me teach about lots of different types of people um, and concepts and ideas. I think the challenge, um, because we're talking about equity too, is, is access to that. You know, like I know for my seventh grade classes, what they are required to do every day, um, they only see me once, you know? And, and, and then it's harder when you think about all the teachers and all the adults that are in the students' lives 
um, how prepared are they as educators to be um, aware of the struggles that identity struggles that young people may be having. You know, a, a math teacher is hard to come by nowadays. You know, it's a shortage area, but but when we have a really good math teacher, it's because they teach math very well. You know, and I'm not saying that math teachers don't. All teachers are capable of empathy with students, but you know, when they're when I'm going to be observed, I'm not being observed and evaluated on how much empathy I have towards my students. I'm being evaluated on content and rigor, which is great for a teacher to be able to do that. But in terms of equity, how do I reach all of my students? Um, and how do I allow them to be supported? And in what avenues or what classes can we do? Can we address ethnic studies? You know, in, in seventh grade, they have world geography um, in, my, in my school. And certain, maybe other districts might have the resources to have um, electives that allow them that opportunity, but in my school there isn't. And a lot of times in schools that they don't, can't afford those opportunities, those are the communities that really need the education and really need the boost in self-confidence and awareness and the more access, accessible um, resources for them to be able to do that. And, and so I, I agree with you 100%. I think it's great. Uh, I just, I, I, I wish that there was a an easier way to introduce ethnic studies um, into all curriculum. Um, so I, I yeah. want, oh. oh, sorry. I want sorry, I, go ahead. Julia and Rosina an opportunity to answer. I feel like we've talked a lot about the vision um, of, you know, what, what this could do, um, the impact it could have on um, historically misrepresented um, or even, you know, groups that are missing from our curriculum. So I'd love for you, Julia and Rosina, to be able to answer on that, that as well, um, as we also introduce the next question around the crucial components of an effective and sustainable educational system that promotes diversity, inclusion, and equity. So what, what does this look like? We've talked about a little bit of the vision of what this could do. Um, I want to give you both a chance to talk a little bit about that and also, um, how, what what will it look like in our in our educational system? So Julia, would you like to start and then Rosina? Sure. Yeah, I can speak to that um, a little bit and, and sort of respond to your previous question, Emily. I just want to say as as a first thing, I I just like all of these stories resonate with me so much, especially because I too also grew up in Chicago um, as a as a first generation immigrant, and and I will say there was like a real moment of anger and pain. I think when I realized going to college and learning about Asian American history for the very first time. And mind you, I went to a college that didn't have an Asian American studies department. So a lot of this was actually self-learning. Um, and, and I think I was really angry when I then went to law school and learned about the case of Wong Kim Ark v. U.S. that established birthright citizenship and you know, really questioned why this wasn't part of any of my classes growing up. So I think definitely there's kind of this, um, sort of this pain from like missing out on learning these um, stories and these histories that reflect my own experience or my own sort of identity. Um, I just want to share a little bit in, in terms of what we've done at the, um, in terms of thinking about how to introduce ethnic studies and, and particularly um, Asian American history curriculum into classrooms because this is something that we think about a lot as advocates and how do we kind of work with educators. Um, and, and I would just say we taught this Chinese American history course in 2018 um, for the last two years in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, and we taught it to a group of students during their Sunday Chinese school classes, um, just because, you know, like Gozer said, it, it you know, it, it takes a lot, I think, to try and introduce this to the public school, and especially as advocates and who are not teachers. Um, we, you know, really had to think about ways to kind of get this information to students, um, you know, before, you know, before conversations about how to do this kind of institution-wide um, were really starting. And from that class alone, we taught um, over the course of two years, four semesters, and the students were largely Chinese American. Some weren't Chinese, but still identified as Asian American. And just from talking about this curriculum um, of, of Chinese American history that then brought in into Asian American history, and we talked about 
um, we wanted to incorporate sort of the history of the civil rights movement into it so that students can really have a discussion about race and think about contemporary parallels. Just over the course of that class, the students gained so much more confidence and they were just much more open to talking about issues like race, like injustice, and we, um, and, and you know, we try and incorporate sort of contemporary issues and at that time, um, Trump had just been elected, so we talked a lot about um, you know, different policy measures that were enacted that were really harmful and what historical similarities there were. And what we also found was that the students really began to engage with the question of their own identity and engage actually with their family history. So one of the students um, wrote a really, we have the students do this pro project at the end of the semester with, where they interview a family member about their own family's immigration history. And one student wrote this really moving essay about interviewing her grandparents who were refugees um, following the Vietnam War, who lived, in, who lived in a refugee camp in Hong Kong and then moved to Connecticut when a family sponsored them. And, um, and, and sort of like having these kids engage even as young as like 10, 11, 12 years old with this, you know, with this really hard history. Um, and parents also came up to us and said like, you know, thank you so much for doing this because for the first time, my children and I are able to have this really meaningful conversation about our own history. So I think it, it really does take a lot um, for, um, and, and it means a lot, I think, for students to see themselves as um, central to the story of American history. And sort of going to your second question, I think it's really important that a curriculum and sort of um, ed education that is inclusive, you know, is, is careful, I think, both to make sure that we talk about racism and systemic racism and the role um, that it has played in U.S. history. And second, I think, to import to, to not just highlight people of color as like examples of contributors or kind of tokens of American history, but really central that narrative right around their experience so that people of color are not just portrayed as victims or kind of passing um, sort of in participants, right, of American history. And I think that's, um, that's something that, you know, is, is really important, I think, to actually making, um, making a change and bring equity in education. Absolutely. Thank you, Julia. Um, you know, just everything everyone has said has resonated with me, especially, you know, my parents being immigrants, um, coming from uh, fleeing the Khmer Rouge, um, and my dad being disabled as well. There's a lot of, you know, me grappling with my identity and having that chance to talk through those things, especially at Sunday school, Sunday Chinese school, where I was like forced to go and mandated to go. It's, it's that opportunity to kind of inject that, um, as Kathy said, kind of like the um, starting point to grapple with these, these issues. So that's, that's awesome. And thank you for the work that you do. Thank you for all the work that you all do. And Rosina, would you like to um, give your perspective on a bit of the vision um, and also what a, what a curriculum might look like um, or just in the educational system, what the crucial components might be or how we might introduce these um, narratives into the educational system. Sure, and I was snapping Kathy up because, you know, I think, I think while it's important to recognize the harms and damages of uh, distorted narratives and missing history and inaccurate representations of people, places and events, um, you know, the damage and harm that it causes, it's important to also recognize what it robs us of um, as educators and as a community, as well as the student and not being able to access a student's spark and, um, and just really benefit from that. It robs peers of that. And so I was glad that you raised that and I'm very interested in that study that you were citing, Kathy. Um, but with respect to, you know, the future of education, I mean, that's now. You know, like I said before, we have this opportunity here with crisis comes opportunity. We have opportunity for change. We have an opportunity right here, and right now to reimagine the future of education tomorrow. And so, you know, look at this brilliant think tank here. We have so many resources and tools that we can leverage. Um, when we talk about the curriculum being, um, we talk about a curriculum being respectful, relevant, responsive. Um, that includes having the narratives, the histories, the backgrounds and experiences and, of diverse identities that they're reflected so that students can see themselves in the context of teaching and learning and that they learn about the world around them in ways that foster appreciation for difference and empathy and respect and, and cultural humility. Um, <clears throat> and it's more effective when it's developed with an equity lens and it aligns with 
who we serve. Like we have to know our community. When I was, you know, at Conard, Emily, I knew that we were very diverse and I thought this is great. Diversity is our strength. And then I'd become a, a principal at the feeder middle school. And yep, this is wonderful. This is great. We're diverse. We love kids. We don't oppress students here. We love them. We wrap them up in our love. Um, but that just wasn't respectful, responsive. It, it wasn't until I'd become a central office um, administrator that I got a view of the whole playing field. And I thought, wow, this is really important to know who we are and who we serve so that we can advocate for our students so that they can see themselves in the context of teaching and learning in the classroom. And so I think knowing the makeup of your district and your schools and your classroom, I think that's important for everybody to know whether you're teaching in that building or you're district-wide or your central office. Um, one, one that is one sustainable thing um, is that it needs to undergo like a rigorous and stringent review and revision process. And, you know, I hate to stop there with, you know, just the curriculum the dynamics of it, um, the essential elements of it, because, um, you know, how we teach is as important as what we teach. And a curriculum that allows educators to access students' funds of knowledge and assets that their families bring is one of the most respectful ways that we can convey a message to students that we're glad you showed up today. Like for students to recognize when, when they don't feel like going to school that day, somebody's going to know I'm missing because I bring so much value to the classroom. Um, so I think that that's important and not to not to frame when there are challenges with connecting or reaching students, they're not the problem. We need to shift from this deficit model. We're the problem. Um, so redefining that and letting students know that you, you matter. And I've also been really intrigued with more increasingly and curious about neuroscience-based teaching. And that goes beyond the surface changes that really build cognitive capacity in students from diverse backgrounds and circumstances and personal dynamics. So I truly feel like while the curriculum is important and all the elements of it, how you teach it, the pedagogy is very, very critical because you can turn a student off from something that was supposed to be such rich history about themselves in the way that you deliver it, maybe you're not authentic. And I think the other piece of that comes the professional development for educators too. That's amazing. Thank you, Rosina. Gozer, I see you're unmuted. Would you like to also add to that? Uh, I'm, I, um, I think that the perspective, you know, like, like Rosina said, uh, teacher prep is important. I think professional development is, is how, once, once a teacher is teaching, um, a lot of times, you know, especially because the state doesn't require teachers to go for CEUs anymore, it, a lot of teachers rely unknowingly on PD for access to diverse um, perspectives. And I think that's something that districts, I know many districts um, are aware of it, but it's hard to access that depending on the districts that you're in. If, you're looking at equity, you know, I know for distance learning, for example, uh, we had to disperse every single technology from our building in order to give our students an opportunity to even be able to do distance learning. You know, and, and so how do you then support teachers to be equipped with the perspectives and the approaches on that? And I think um, I, I'd like to see that more uh, often for PD to be more, um, um, you know, like yesterday in the panel that we're in, we talked about courageous conversations, you know, programs like that for teachers to have even restorative uh, practices are great. Restorative um, justice circles are a great way to talk about these issues or these topics for teachers and students and community members. Um, but I think it's an, it has to be more intentional to t for school districts to create these opportunities. I know through working with the NCCJ in any town, you know, we, we did a lot of uh, PR and reaching out to school districts, but a lot of schools now are also reaching out to organizations to, in order to be able to get that support. Um, and I want to see that support be with students and with teachers um, as, as a resource. And for Julia and Kathy, I think that that's an avenue also is working with, um, I think, you know, like Emily said, working in the corporate world, 
reaching out in, in those avenues also to try to go in and work through those avenues so that there are more perspectives that students are getting exposed to, but also teachers, because I, 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 I truly believe that every teacher has a heart to do that, but is not necessarily equipped. And it's similar to when we talk about students who don't see representation, we're not equipped. We don't have the strategies and how to navigate that. Um, and I think a lot of times teachers take offense when they're being accused of being racist or when they're being accused of something. And, and how does the teacher address that is, is significant to how that student or that classroom feels about that teacher. And if that teacher is capable of um, teaching their perspective so that they can feel comfortable also or giving the space for them to have the, their emotions and their perspective so that they can work through it. Um, there's a lot of components, but I think, you know, the school districts are, are important and have to be intention, more intentional in creating those opportunities also. Thank you, Gozer. Thank yeah. You. Oh, sorry, is someone, did someone unmute? Or is that my, my echo? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, um, so I, I'm hearing a lot of themes about, you know, the kind of unconscious and implicit ways that this has navigated, it, it, you know, systemic racism, institutional oppression, and all of these, you know, nuances have navigated its way into our educational system as, you know, as a result of um, it being a part of our history and society and, you know, what, what the impact is that we can see from, from including these perspectives and seeing yourself as an individual in the, I, I keep hearing the theme, seeing yourself as an individual with your identities represented in a larger context. Um, so I think that's, that's really important. That's a really important point that I hear you all touch on. Um, so as it relates to, you know, um, Connecticut passing a, and I know I'm, I'm kind of pivoting a little bit, but feel free to, you know, jump back to any questions or topics that we've discussed. Um, but Connecticut passed the Ethnic Studies Bill in 2019 um, as a part of a movement to include ethnic studies in public school curriculums, uh, specifically to include Black and Puerto Rican history into pre-existing Latinx and African American history in public schooling. Um, so in terms of having that bill, you know, um, Asian Americans are not necessarily represented in this bill. So can we can we kind of, I guess, talk through what the rolling out process is, what, um, you know, if, if we can't include Asian American perspectives or even other perspectives um, in, that, in that kind of legislation, then what can we do? Um, and how might we make that happen? That's a huge question, I know. Um, but uh, feel free to kind of touch on anything that I've responded to. Stephen, I see that you are unmuted, so I will defer to you. <laughs> I, I think you know from a from a policy uh, uh, from a policy perspective, I, we we have to you know often the answer that you'll find to the question that you just posed like why wasn't it included, and and the answer was is really simple. Well, you know no one no one asked for it. That wasn't what we were talking about. You know we didn't intentionally exclude it. Is the answer, and as it is, it is just as bad, if not worse, to intentionally exclude than to not intentionally include. Because, because the problem there is that it is, in, it is through intentionality that we address these issues. It's through intentionality that we expand the table. We have to be intentional in the way that we open the doors to, to, to reflecting the real diversity, not only of the state, but just of, our, uh, of, the, of the planet. And so, so my, my answer to that is, you know, we have to intentionally expand that table. And so what's the process? What's the, you know, is there a, is there a public information campaign? Is there, you know, an education of individual members? What is the, the civic process of getting something included? Yes, it's all of those things, but it's really just doing it. You know, the, the, the civics, the, 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 the stage of civics is not as complicated as you think. It is only complicated by the inability to imagine that something can just happen. Thank you, Stephen. And I think, you know, it, 
what you're touching on too with you know how might we do this i think julia and kathy you know with the work that they've done around the immigrant history initiative and um kind of embedding that history into their you know found an opportunity where where you know asian and asian american students are learning they're learning chinese but here's an opportunity to embed um more of that those opportunities around ethnic studies um, and kind of jumpstart that that identity um, search. Rosina, I see that you're unmuted. Would you like to add? I just, I love what you said, Stephen, just do it, not to sound like the Nike slogan, but I think that change comes from the, should come from the bottom up without legislation. I think it's, we can just do it, right? And then we guide policy and we guide legislation. I think that what what the benefit of legislation is that good intention and promises don't always endure. And so then we've got a good thing and in order to sustain it, um, because, you know, other priorities come into play with, um, you know, funding and staffing and all that stuff. So I think that that's where legislation really, that's where we have our claws. But I think that we really just, we don't need to wait to be man. I think it's disrespectful. I mean, it's like I'm sitting here with all of you and, and this beautiful grid. And if I were to invite you to my house tonight and just kind of ignore what you've shared about, you know, your cultures and, you know, I, it, would, it, would be, it would be disrespectful to just serve you something that I like, you know, and without, with any disregard, with all the disregard. So I feel like, you know, legislation's great, but change can come from us, you know, the, from the voice. And that's what we have to do. We have to elevate the voice. And I think that we tend to have people in the community um, that like numbers, they like data. And, you know, the data shows it, but also student voices. I mean, isn't that what we're here for? Isn't that what, why we get up in the morning? And so I think we really need to hear from students more. And that's something that I'm committed to doing, like really hearing the voices of students um, and having that mandate of what we do and how we do better. Thank you, Rosina and Yuki. I do see you're unmuted, so I want to call on you. I want to um, acknowledge that we did we did say that we would be ending 15 minutes later, so um, we will have some time for Q and A. I'll probably start that around 2:38, so we have a bit of time. But I want to give some time to Yukio to to add to that as well. Sure. Um, I think there's there's a lot of great people in Connecticut that have been doing the work. Um, and, you know, there's a whole grid of us here and there's a whole grid of, you know, other Asian American advocates um, that are not necessarily on the screen, but um, I know that I've talked to uh, the subcommission members um, uh, and also some people at UConn that have been doing a lot of this work without, within the, um, the state. And, you know, I would love to be able to have more connections uh, with my Asian American and Asian community members across the state. When we first moved to Connecticut, I, you know, we specifically chose West Hartford because statistically there was a lot more of us in West Hartford, right? Um, but I'm still like, where are they? Like, where are my Asian people? <laughs> like, I, you know, it, it's hard to make these connections, um, but I would love to take this opportunity to start like an intentional group of us that are so passionate about this um, and, and really, you know, lean on the old guards and, you know, learn from them, you know, get youth into this conversation and, and just start building that momentum and just do it, I think. Um, and I, I'm excited that you are all here and passionate and, you know, we're reaching out to other families and other students. Um, but, but also um, when I looked at, the state level, um, the government, right? We don't have a lot of Asian representation either. Um, so I think, you know, we have to get political too. <laughs> I know it's not our strong suit, but I think we do have to be really civically engaged and, and, and trying to move things, um, you know, again, education is a system, right? The government is a system and they're both somewhat racist. <laughs> Um, and so we, we have to go from the ground up, but we also have to go from the top down too. So thank you. 
Thank you so much. Uh, Gozer, would you like to touch on that? And then I think we'll- Yeah, I, I've been reading some of the questions and answers. Sorry, Emily, if you don't mind. Um, Please. So, and I think some of the questions uh, touch upon what we're saying here. And, you know, I, I, I'm very much so a just do it person. You know, um, one of the hardest things for me is to see uh, when a student feels comfortable with me, like when I was an admin or a classroom teacher, you know, they feel comfortable with me, but when they leave my presence in the building, um, they're not always safe and comfortable um, when they leave that. And I think that that's why working as a community is important and having intentional programming for adults and for young people is important. Um, but I also think what you, Yukio is saying is really important also for us. And that's something we noticed yesterday in the previous panel I had participated in, is we don't have the support for um, providing these resources for Asian and Asian American communities. But not just that, you know, when, when somebody is looking for that support because they might not have an Asian or Asian American um, educator or access point, you know, what are those resources for those school districts or for policy writers when, when they're writing like the ethnic studies bills, you know, where's the voice? And uh, did the person who participate try to look out for a resource of some sort and do they exist? You know, and I know that there's a lot of resources that do exist, but you have to dig, you know, and you have to know what language to use in order to research that, to be able to access that support for students. Um, and, I, I, you know, whether it's professional development or community organizations or whatever, I think it's important that a good place to start is to start a coalition that combines a lot of different perspectives and resources, whether it is Asian Americans, you know, it could be an administrator who works in a predominant, not, maybe not predominantly, but a higher population of Asian American students who has a, um, a connection and a value to supporting their community who might have, who may have a larger population. I think all of those voices are important um, for us to, have together and provide that as a resource. You know, having a curriculum like what Julia and Kathy are doing is, is wonderful and I think it's beautiful. I know my independent study was an attempt to try to create an Asian American resource, you know, and it was an attempt and that was over 10 years ago, you know, so it's really important that the, it has to continue and I'm happy to hear that there are so many different people who are are, are working on those. How do we bring all of those resources together and how do we provide that for school districts or policy lawmakers or, you know, corporate organizations who, who, who are looking for opportunities to get into schools, who are looking to try to get a certain demographic of students or of workers into their companies and organizations. How do we do that? And I think that this is, I don't know, it's groundwork stuff. Yeah. So thank you, Gozer. I, I'm like having a brain blast right now because as you all are speaking, I'm kind of imagining, you know, like the way that a system is set up top, top to bottom, bottom to top, you know, structured and, and sound, right? And, and I, I saw a quote that was saying that like, this, the system's not broken. It's working just the way it's supposed to be because it's working against, and that was obviously in relation to more of a bigger like system as a nation, not, not necessarily the educational system, because I think a lot of people have the intentions to change it, right? Um, but I think, you know, it's, it's sound. There's, there's so many, you know, moving parts. And I think that what we're talking about as a coalition, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining, you know, people from the top, bottom, middle, everywhere, and people from outside in the community kind of bombarding it from the side and infiltrating, you know, that system to really bring those those intentional um, resources and access. And I, I want to, you know, give some time. I, I want to be aware that we we already took 15 extra minutes of your time. So um, about five minutes left. And we do have a couple of Q&A questions around, I'll give you some general topics. And then I think, because um, I want to address them all, we don't have time, but um, the general topics around the Q and A that I've seen so far is, you know, around um, being in maybe like a in West Hartford um, and 
and having being fortunate that we have resources maybe in one part of the district um, but not every district has the same resource and opportunities what can West Hartford do to partner and collaborate with other districts um, to create educational equity across Connecticut um, there's also some other Q&A around careers um, and what we can do uh, what careers can you recommend for people to go into this space and make change in equity um, I think those are kind of two questions that are representative of a lot of the questions on Q&A, but I'm afraid we don't have enough time to answer all of them. So if you want to talk about either maybe the, the disparities in education or maybe careers that you could go into. Stephen? Let's see. You know, on the question of equitable access to educational opportunity, uh, our education system mirrored you know, the old ways in which education was accessed, which is privilege, a franchise, um, ever expanding, but slowly, and only expanding because we fight for it. If we flip that narrative and we think of educational opportunity as a fundamental human right, then for those of our districts that have had the privilege of enjoying that fundamental human right, turn to your neighbors and help them fight for it. Thank you. That that was very well said. I absolutely agree. Um, anybody else want to touch on, um, you know, what we might be able to do, um, or also what you might be able to contribute in terms of professional development or careers that you can go into to kind of be a part of this coalition, um, and to to you know help fight help in that fight for for education as a fundamental right. Sorry, I unmuted my mic again. I'm sorry. Um, I, I really like what Stephen and Rosanna said earlier about the, you know, just doing it, you know, just do it. And I think that that's a really good place to start. Um, as a teacher, I don't always, I, I know that there are ways that I'm supposed, uh, rules that I'm supposed to follow to bring in and invite other community uh, people in. But sometimes I just need that resource. You know, a student may have asked a question and then I'm gonna, I need to reach out. And I think that that's important um, is just reaching out to somebody in another school district uh, and say, hey, what are, what are you doing to, around this? What is your school doing around this? And maybe that individual you speak to has no idea, but knows someone in their school district or in their school community that can connect you. Um, you know, I, 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 I know that it's long removed from doing pen pal type stuff, but it's similar, you know, connecting with other school communities through communication. And look, we're Zooming from multiple different places right now. And that's, a, that's another accessible resource is just sharing class time um, with different perspectives. I think that that's a good place to just do it type of a deal. You know, like those are safe ways to introduce different perspectives that you don't have to necessarily um, ask permission for because that's enriching uh, student culture, student life, and student perspectives. Um, but I really like that just do it. If you have an idea, kind of just do it. Most, most um, schools are open to the possibility of reaching out to other schools. It, it looks, it's a good way to engage students. Students get really excited. You know, they, they do the hair, they wear their accessories, they want to look good. And they feel really good and then they leave the space and they have questions and they want to continue that and, uh, and even even if it's just a couple of students a lot of times those are the students who maybe disengage and it's a great way to just just do it just figure out what's the easiest way to do it um, and I, I don't want to speak for everybody here but as I would be open as a resource um, to connect people to each other also you know like I might not be able to directly but I can provide avenues of resources and things like that too. Awesome, thanks Gozer and Rosina. Um, would you like to touch on that as well? I think just briefly, I'd like to say that we need, well, we need to recognize that while our schools are rooted in systemic racism, I saw one of the comments, we also need to recognize that our schools are also deeply rooted in structural racism. You know, and that cuts across, you know, social, political, economic structures and that um, we have way in West Harvard, because I heard West Harvard specifically, we have way, we have a lot of lines of effort um, and we're not all pulling on the same road. And I don't mean any disrespect, but we have a lot of well-intentioned do-gooders not pulling on the same rope. So 
we're not all doing the right heavy lifting. And I think that if we could, you know, pull our resources together, we could work smarter together and we can move the needle faster. Well said, Rosina, thank you. Um, I wanna acknowledge that we are at the end of our time, but I do wanna give Julia, Yukio and Kathy um, just a chance to, um, you know, give any closing statements or um, touch on what, what has been said and then we can, we can close. <laughs> Um, I just really want to thank you all and for for being such an inspiration and you know as a former educator I'm glad that people you know are out here doing all this good work um, with our students and I just would really like to cry now out of joy out of joy <laughs> so thank you again for the opportunity this has been wonderful um, and, and I hope that we can continue to connect and, and grow together. Thank you. Thanks, Yukio, Julia, or Kathy. Yeah, just to echo, I'm so grateful that y'all have organized this conversation and so grateful also be connected to so many amazing people who are clearly doing really, really amazing work. And I just wanna put Julia and I up as a resource as well. I think, what Gozer said was so inspiring. And at the same time, I feel like we already put so much on our teachers. And I think like in the current status quo, if a teacher wants to bring these stories into the classroom, it's on them. They are the ones doing the grunt work. They're the ones spending the extra hours and staying up late to try to find this information. And to the extent that our organization can help mitigate any of that, Julie and I are very, very happy to be a resource. And honestly, like that is one of the primary reasons that we exist. So please reach out. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think Kathy said it all. Thank you all for being here today. And thank you, Emily, for organizing. And thank you, Stephen, for organizing. Um, yeah, and I, like Kathy said, I, I think like we are like a very, very small piece of this. I think we just want to be here to support the parents and the teachers and the policymakers who want to make this happen. And I think it's a real learning opportunity for us to hear, you know, from your perspectives, what is required for change to happen. So we're here to support. Yeah, I'd like to add thank you as well. Thank you for allowing me to share this space and um, to just learn a little bit more and be in honest dialogue um, and, and reflective dialogue. And Emily, you know, for me, thank you for this opportunity because it gives me um, reassurance that you know that whatever missteps I might have made early in my career, this has given me an opportunity to have a good do-over and in partnership with everyone else. And Stephen, you said, you know, turn to your neighbor, knock on your neighbor's door and bring them into this work. Those of you who are listening, you know, go knock on your neighbor's door at a safe social distance and say, come on out, let's do this work. We can only get better um, with collective capacity. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. And Rosina, thank you for your humility. I, I don't see any missteps, um, at least from my perspective. I think I'm, I'm so proud to have been a part of this panel and to have connected with you all. Um, also, I, I am definitely a resource for you all as well. I'm so early in my career and so passionate and so ready to do this type of work. So please reach out to me um, as a resource, you know, even personally to professionally in any capacity and I just thank you all so so much for your your expertise your knowledge and also just being able to um, you know articulate all of all of this so I, I just really appreciate that um, thank you all for your perspective and um, with that I think we can close for now please stay connected um, I'm, I'm glad we were in the Zoom room together. I, I really do feel connected, um, even physically, even though we're not in the same room. So um, thank you and keep continuing to be strong and, and um, moving forward with this, with this amazing work that you all are doing. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. Thank you.